Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. It's good to be with you. A special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you're with us this morning. So it was a few weeks back. It was a Tuesday morning, and we were getting our kids ready to get out the door for school. And Becky had already left with one child to drop them off, and so I was left with the other two at home. And it was about five or ten minutes before we were to head out the door and our two kids were in the kitchen, just sitting at the kitchen table playing with something. And I walked in and I said, hey girls, we got to leave in about five minutes. So you should probably go brush your teeth and get your shoes on. So I gave them that little directive. I turned to walk out of the kitchen and as I'm about walking out, one of them says, you can't tell me what to do. And I stopped and I was like, I walked back towards him and I was like, excuse me? And she had the audacity to say it again. You can't tell me what to do. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me, right? Now, in her defense, I think she was trying to be funny. Like, I think she was trying to, like, have a little joke with dad. But I was like, okay, I need to use this moment to let her know something. And so I looked her in the eye and I said, I absolutely can tell you what to do. Like, I am your dad. Like, that is my job. I get paid as your dad to tell you what to do. Your job in this relationship is to do the things I tell you to do. That's how this works. And she goes, okay. So she said, let's try that again. We're going to leave in about five minutes. You need to go brush your teeth and put your shoes on. And what do you think they did? They walked out of the kitchen. They went to go brush their teeth and put their shoes on. As a dad, the thing that I want from my kids is for them to do what I ask them to do. Like any parent would want that. But, but I don't just want them to do the things that I ask them to do because eventually they actually did what I asked them to do. What I really want as a dad is that they would do it willingly, right? That they would do it with some desire, that they would understand that like as their dad, I want what's best for them. I'm trying to teach them to raise and raise them so that they live a healthy, full life. And so the things that I actually ask them to do are for their good. I want them to understand and see that. And believe it or not, God desires that same thing with us. He, he desires that we would live in a certain way that honors him, that pleases him, that we would order our lives in such a way so that we know that God, yes, desires what's good for me, and he's leading me in a way that is bringing me to the fullness of who he has created me to be. But the big question is how? Like, how do I cultivate that mindset in my kids? And even more specifically, how do we cultivate that mindset in ourselves as it pertains to God? Like, are we going to follow God begrudgingly with resistance? Or are we willing to do it with desire and a sense of willingness? And so our passage this morning actually starts to unpack, at some level, how we can become those types of people. So we're in chapter 7 of Romans, starting in verse 1, and this is what Paul read, says. He says, Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law. So we're in a section of Romans where Paul is continuing to circle around three topics. Those three topics are one, grace, two, the law, and three, sin. If you're an avid note taker, you might want to write those three words down. Grace, law, and sin. And he keeps talking about how these three things relate to each other and how these three things relate to us. Grace, law, and sin. And entering into chapter 7, we are entering into the chapter where Paul will talk about the law the most in all of his letter to the Romans. And it raises then the question, what exactly is the law and what is our relationship to it? And this was huge, a huge question for the church in the first century, because as the church got started, the church was made up of Jewish Christians, people who were raised Jewish, but yet received Jesus as the Messiah. And the law was a central part to the people of God. And what the law did was it distinguished them, it distinguished the Jewish people from all the other nations around them. 
And in the Old Testament, there's 613 laws for the Jewish people to follow. Laws that range from health, hygiene, and diet laws. Laws that are uh, religious laws, talking about practices and traditions and rhythms and religious festivals that they were supposed to attend. There's even laws around sin and how you atone for sin through sacrifices. There's even laws about living in community and what it means to be a good neighbor. All of these laws that they were supposed to follow, and these laws separated them and distinguished them from all the other nations around them. I had a friend in high school. His name was Josh. And Josh's family had lobster every year on Christmas. Like that was their Christmas meal. So most of us are eating turkey or ham or roast beef or whatever. But every year, Josh would tell us like, hey, I bet you're coming. Wish you were coming to my house for Christmas. We're having lobster. And he told everybody every year. It was a tradition that distinguished his family from everybody else. The law was a set of traditions, rituals, rhythms, among other things, that distinguished the people of God from all the other nations and was supposed to reflect the character of God to the nations. Now, what starts to happen, though, as the church develops, is that Gentiles, people who are non-Jewish, start to respond to the gospel, receive it through faith, and enter into the family of God. And they have no awareness of the Jewish law. They were not raised with it. They don't know what it is. They're not sure how they're supposed to make sense of it. And so the question is, at the beginning of the church, is how should the Gentiles interact with the Jewish law? Essentially, should they have to follow the law? And there were those who were emphatically saying, yes, any Gentile that's becoming a Jesus follower now has to take on the Jewish law. And so the church in Rome was made up of two groups of people, Jewish Christians who were following the law and Gentile Christians who knew nothing of the law. And part of the reason why Paul is writing the book of Romans is because there's tension between these two groups. Because there are those Jewish Christians who are saying, yes, they must follow the law. And there are those who are saying, no, we don't have to. And notice who Paul is addressing as we start into chapter 7. This is verse 1 again. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I am speaking to those who know the law. And who would those people be? They would be the Jewish believers who were raised with the law and who hold the law in high esteem. But notice what Paul says about the nature of the law. He says, the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. Essentially saying death negates the law. And Paul in verse 2 is going to give an illustration from marriage about how Christians should understand and relate to the law. This is what he says in verse 2. He says, for example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So in this illustration, Paul is saying that a wife is bound to her husband by the law. A wife is bound to her husband by the law. The law ties them together. So therefore, her relationship to the law is obligation and duty. But if the husband dies, she is released from her obligation and duty to the law. And then Paul reiterates this in verse 3. This is what he says in verse 3. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But... If her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So Paul is using this illustration right, to close the gap on our understanding of the law and our relationship to it. So the natural question is, okay, how does this illustration apply to us? Right, where are we in this illustration? And what Paul is saying is essentially, in this illustration, we are the wife. Even if you're a man here this morning, you are the wife in this illustration. Because the point Paul is trying to make is that we have been set free. We are set free from the law. He will say in verse 6 in this passage, we have been released from the law. And the point of the illustration 
is that the wife is released from the law. So we are the wife. We are released from the law. And the point Paul is making is that it happens through death. Now, as Paul moves on, like if this isn't confusing enough, as Paul moves on from his illustration to the explanation, it gets a little confusing. Because in the illustration, we're the wife and someone else dies. That someone else is the husband, right? But in the explanation he'll give, he'll say, we die. And also in the explanation, there is no direct parallel to the role of the husband. Listen for this as we move through verse 4. He says, So my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead. Right, so again, in the explanation, it's not that somebody else died, but it's we died. Did you catch that in verse 4? He says, you also died. You also died. We died. In the illustration, the wife is bound to the husband through law. But in the explanation, it's like, well, what about us? To whom or to what are we bound? Because he doesn't fill that in, in his explanation. And scholars say that through the law, we are bound to sin. See, not only does the law distinguish the Israelites from every other nation on earth, the law also is given in order to expose sin. And if sin was to be personified, Paul personifies sin with the person of Adam. This goes back all the way to chapter 5. He says that sin came into the world through Adam. And so, even though there's a switch in the explanation, he's saying the husband died, but in this now explanation, he's saying we died. And what we died to was the law, which exposes sin, and Adam, who is the personification of sin. And all of that happens through Jesus Christ. So it's through Jesus and his death and our death with him that we are now released or freed or dead to the law in sin. Meaning, it's no longer the law in sin that defines us. We are now bound to Jesus. It's no longer that we are distinguished by sin or by law, or the death that comes from sin, but we are now distinguished by Jesus and specifically his grace. And so in this illustration, you see those three words, grace, law, and sin, all come together, that we are dead to sin because we are alive to God through Christ. We are released from the law. It no longer distinguishes us. It is grace, the grace that comes through Christ that distinguishes us. And Paul is saying, here's the intended hoped for outcome of a life that is bound to Christ and not Adam or sin. This is what he says again, verse 4. He says, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead. In order that, here's the purpose statement, that we might bear fruit for God. The intended outcome of the Christian life is that our lives would produce fruit. And Jesus says this. Jesus says this in his last meal with the disciples, the night before he goes to the cross. He's praying with the disciples, and he encourages them to remain in me, he says. Essentially, be bound to me. Remain in me, and I in you, so that you can do what? Bear much fruit. Fruit that will last. And we're told in Galatians, the fruit that should characterize the Christian life is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Have you ever been around somebody 
whose life is characterized by those nine things, consistently and continually, if you've ever been around somebody who like exudes those things, you're like, oh, I just want to be around them all the time. I mean, somebody who lives that way, it's like their life is infectious. You're like, I just want to know them. I want to be their friend. I want to have their phone number so I can text them. I just want to show up to their house and have coffee. Because somebody who just exudes the fruit of the Spirit, it's like, oh, I want them in my life. When we lived in Atlanta, there was a large church in the area called Grace Church. And there was a worship leader at this church named Aaron Keyes. We actually sang one of his songs this morning. And this church would put on conferences regularly, and Aaron and his worship ministry would put on worship schools where you would go for a week at a time. You'd actually stay at his house. You'd go to the church. I mean, just really extensive thing. And Becky had the opportunity to attend one of his worship schools. So she goes to the school, has an amazing time. A few months later, I'm at Grace Church for another event, another conference, and I see this guy, Aaron. Never met him before, but my wife spent a week with him, 12 other people, and his wife, and she came back and had a phenomenal time. So he shows up to this room. We're in a large meeting room, and he just walks in the door. He's got like this long flowing hair at the time, kind of looking like, you know, if Jesus was alive today, I picture Aaron would probably be Jesus because he just like exudes the fruit of the Spirit. He walks into the door, and he's got this huge smile on his face that makes him look like a clown. Ear to ear, huge smile. He has this warm, gentle spirit about him, and I wanted to go thank him. And so I went up to him and said, hey, my name is Brian. You don't know me. But my wife, Becky, spent a week at your worship school and had the time of her life. And she grew so much. And she literally is a different person from attending your school. And I just wanted to say thank you. And he was like, Becky, I love Becky. I mean, he had never met Becky before that week. He didn't even know who I was. But in that moment, he was so dialed in. He was kind and he was gentle. He gave me all of his attention. It was as though I was the only person in the room with him. He was totally dialed in to his interaction with me. Fast forward then a few months later, we were at another ministry event and he was there. We didn't know he was going to be there. Becky and I are there together. I haven't talked to him or interacted with him since then. And we're walking through the lobby of the church. He's on one side, we're on the other, and our paths are just happening to cross. And about halfway through, he sees us and he goes, it's the Marvels! And he like comes at us with his arms wide open for big, big hugs. That's only my second interaction with this guy. But again, he's talking to us as though we are his best friends, as though he loves us and he wants to spend all kinds of time with us. Okay, then fast forward a year from that moment. I'm at another ministry event. He is there. And part of this ministry event is putting us in small groups together. He and I get put in the same small group. And through our small group conversation, I was just expressing some frustrations that I had about the church and this and that. And after the small group session, he's like, hey, come talk to me. I got something I want to tell you. And basically what he did was he rebuked me for the things that I was frustrated about, kind of setting my mindset differently. And as he was doing that, he was so gentle and he was so kind. I was like, I think that was the best rebuke I've ever received in my life. Like somehow I have to learn how to be kind when I have to rebuke people. And then one more interaction. Elmbrook was looking for a new worship pastor about a year ago. My dad's on staff there. My dad was leading that charge. And so I was like, hey, I know a worship guy. So I email Aaron. Like I find his email on the internet. I email him. It's like, hey, my dad's here. He's looking for a worship guy. Would you be willing to talk to him just as a networking call? And he seems like, oh yeah, I'd love to. Absolutely. My dad gets on a Zoom call with him. And again, now it's probably been about five years since I've talked to this guy. And he gets on the Zoom call with my dad. He's like, I love Brian. I love Becky. They're amazing. I'm like, I haven't even talked to this guy in the longest time. But what he does is he just exudes love. He exudes kindness. He exudes gentleness and patience, compassion, self-control, all of these things, goodness. And I'm like, that's the kind of person that I want to be. And I want to be around those types of people. And what Paul is saying is that you have all the resources at your disposal to be that kind of person. To be the kind of person that exudes this list of nine things who can produce 
fruit for God. He, he uses this list as a way of saying produce fruit for God. In Galatians, he calls it the fruit of the Spirit. It's basically the same thing. We have the ability to be those kind of people. But again, the question is how? Now, in a culture like America, we are raised up with the values of hard work and hustle, right? Like Americans love hard work and hustle. We also love stories of people who pull themselves up by their bootstraps, work really hard, and make something of themselves. We live in the land of the self-made man and woman. Anybody, no matter your background, no matter where you come from, no matter your economic situation, through hard work and hustle, you can be anything you want to be. That, that's the story of our culture. And we love stories like that. We love stories of people who started companies and garages and now are leading a global empire, right? Think of Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak, and Apple. Started in his garage in Palo Alto, California, and now it's this worldwide global technology empire. We love those stories. And so, we easily think that good things come through hard work, right? But if we import that same mentality into our spiritual lives, we might believe Producing fruit simply comes through hard work. It simply comes through trying hard. I have to wake up at 3.45 every morning, spend an hour and a half in prayer and reading the Bible, and then I go out into the world. I serve anybody and everybody who comes my way. I'm disciplined. I watch my mouth. I don't put things in that are garbage so garbage doesn't come out, and I work, 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 work really hard at that, right? But the problem with that is what we've done is we've taken this mentality of hard work, hustle, and trying really hard, and we've just created a new modern-day law. And the law was never intended to bring salvation to Israel. The law at best was to distinguish them, but the law was also intended to expose sin. We'll see that as we move through the rest of chapter 7. That it exposes sin because the law is just an extension of who God is, his faithfulness, his gracious, and his character, but it also reveals to us the gap between God's grace, compassion, and love, and our lack of those things. It exposes sin. And so when we just try really hard, we might be able to do that for a little while, but there comes a point when trying hard isn't enough and it doesn't work. And then Paul says, we place this expectation on the law and do something and have this view of the law, something it was never intended to do, bring salvation. And when we live in that way, it actually produces a certain type of fruit, a different sort of fruit from the fruit of the Spirit. This is what he says in verse 5. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, and for the flesh for Paul is just another term to describe our sin nature. And he'll start to use it a lot as we get into chapter 8. Another way to think of the flesh is this idea of being bound to Adam or bound to sin. In the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law, he says. Or again, another way to say it is the sin that was exposed by the law that was at work in us. So when we're in the realm of the flesh, sinful passions were exposed by the law so that we bore fruit for death. Woof. Fruit for death. Have you ever like picked up an apple and it looks so great on the outside and then you bite into it and it's just rotten and it's mush? I like my apples crisp and sweet and crunchy. And when I take one and I bite into it and it's mush, it just makes me want to like, oh, spit it out and throw up in my mouth, right? Fruit for death has that sort of like connotation to it. It's just, oh, it's disgusting. And so what Paul is doing here is he's contrasting two different types of fruit. There's the fruit for God or the fruit of the Spirit, and then the fruit bore to death, or you could say the fruit of the flesh. And the purpose of the law is not to bring salvation, but in part the purpose of the law is to expose our sin. And if we just try and work really hard, ultimately we're just going to produce fruit from the flesh or fruit for death. So it was the Saturday before Easter Sunday. So it was April 10th. 
And it was one of those like gray overcast days and we had this Easter egg hunt activity in the park in our neighborhood. And so we went to that. Kate was working at it with our Girl Scout troop. And the other two were hunting eggs. And so we finished that. And Becky said, hey, I'm going to go to the gym. And then I'm going to meet a friend for lunch. Is that okay? I was like, yeah, absolutely. And so then Kate went and spent the, the day with a friend who was a part of our Girl Scout troop. So I had two other kids. And I took them home. And I was like, hey, we're just going to hang out at home for the afternoon. We're going to just kind of do some things. But one of the things we need to do is we need to pick up the house. We just need to put things away. We need to clean up. It'll take us just a few minutes, and then you guys can do whatever you want. So we're cleaning up. They're kind of resistant. They're not being super helpful. And then I go down to the basement to start picking up the basement, and I lose my cool lose my mind. Now, I've been in the basement a lot. I've been trying to like fix up our basement and make it a space for our kids to play. And so certainly they were down there playing because it was just a mess all over the place. There was popcorn like ground into the carpet downstairs. Somehow granola bar wrappers and cheese stick wrappers are found all over our house. Like you put your hand down in between any cushions in our house. You will probably pull up a granola bar wrapper or a cheese stick wrapper. And I'm down there and I'm just seeing all this and I just lose my cool. And I start thinking to myself, I'm telling myself this story. These rotten kids, they don't respect their dad. Like I'm working really hard to create this space for them so that they can play and they don't even have the decency to keep it clean. So I bring the two of them downstairs, and I'm like, wow, telling all of this to them. It's a mess. You don't care about me. You don't care about the work that I'm doing to this house. And they're like, sorry, right? So then, like, I just tell them to go upstairs, go away, and I start cleaning the mess. And then it starts to snow, right? You remember this? April 10th, it snowed. It snowed on April 10th, and then again on April 18th. There's something wrong with our state. (laughs) So... Like, they decide to go outside and play in the snow. I put on their boots, their pants, their jacket, and they go play the building a snowman. My wife eventually comes home, and she's like, oh, the kids are playing in the snow. That's so sweet. And then she comes to the kitchen, and I'm doing dishes, and she's like, are you okay? And I'm like, I think they're out there because they're trying to get away from me. I think that's what's happening here because I lost my cool on them. I'm like, they weren't being all that helpful, but I probably shouldn't have reacted the way that I did. Now, in that moment, if Becky were to come alongside me and say, you know, Brian, we are called to be patient people as followers of Jesus Christ. You need to try harder next time to be patient. Now, if she had responded that way, all she would have been doing was putting the law in front of me. Because I knew in that moment, I did not need that because I knew in my moment that I was not being patient. Paul says in Romans 2, verse 15, that the law is actually written on our heart. So at some level, we have intuition when we're not living in a way that aligns with God's reality. We have this intuition that something is amiss in us. And so if she were to come in and say, Brian, you just need to try harder and be patient, it would have just heaped more shame and more guilt on me. And essentially what Paul is saying as part of this passage is he's saying is that love can't be legislated. You can't legislate love. You can't demand or command love. That's not how love works. And so if somebody is not being loving, if they're not being patient, and you want them to become loving, if you want them to become patient, the response is not to say, here's the law, you just need to work harder. There's another way that this happens. And this is what Paul says to finish out this passage in verse 6. He says, but now, by dying to what once bound us, the law, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. He, he's saying the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and the rest, love can't be legislated. Rather, he's saying true fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, comes from freedom. Fruit comes from freedom. Freedom, freedom from performing or earning, trying to prove yourself to anybody. See, in that moment on that Saturday afternoon as I was washing dishes, watching my kids try and get away from me playing outside, what I needed was not the law. I needed grace. I needed grace for somebody to say, yep, I get it. It happens to me too. And you know what? There'll be another day. Tomorrow's a new day. We get to start over tomorrow. 
So you probably should go apologize to the kids, but just know you're free from any condemnation. Grace is what sets us free. Uh, I read a book a few months back called Gentle and Lowly. Highly recommend it. It's a great book that simply describes the character of Christ as somebody who is gentle and lowly. And in this chapter, it's like, I don't know, chapter three or four or whatever, the writer is using this illustration of a doctor who goes into a remote jungle to heal this kind of remote tribe. He, he writes this, A compassionate doctor has traveled deep into the jungle to provide medical care to a tribe afflicted with a contagious disease. He has his medical equipment flown in, and he has correctly diagnosed the problem, and he has the antibiotics prepared and available to treat the disease, and he has done this all by his own organization. But as he seeks to provide care, the afflicted are cautious and skeptical. They initially refuse. But eventually, a few brave young men and women step forward to receive the care being freely provided. In that moment, what does the doctor feel? He feels joy. His joy increases to the degree that the sick come to him for help and healing because it's the whole reason he came. And then he goes on to say, here's the translation to our walk with Jesus. When you come to Christ for mercy and love and help in your anguish and perplexity and sinfulness, you are going with the flow of his own deepest wishes, not against them. Because the thing that Jesus longs to do is to make us whole. He says that Christ gets more joy and comfort than we do when we come to him for help and mercy, his heart and joy is engaged in new ways when we present to him our foibles and failures because his desire is to heal us and make us whole. So when we go to Jesus, when we have this awareness of our life doesn't match up with the things that he has for us, he doesn't bring condemnation and a finger wagging, ah, I told you so. You should have known better. He's like, oh, come. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He offers us grace, and it's that grace that empowers us and sets us free so that we can be people who bear fruit, the fruit of love. So at one point in time, maybe the law was supposed to distinguish the people of God from the rest of the nations. But now we live in a time when it's the fruit of the Spirit, this supernatural Spirit-filled love that should distinguish us from everybody else. Jesus will say all of the law, all of the prophets, every 613 commands can be boiled down into two, love God and love others. Jesus will say in John 13, again, the night before his crucifixion, a new command I give you. This one thing, this is it. It's all about this, is love. Love one another. But again, how do we do that? How do we become people who naturally, willingly follow in that way and go to Jesus, be bound to him so that we can develop the fruit of love? I think it first starts with recognition. It first starts with knowing when we are not living by the fruit of the Spirit. So with this list up in front of us, the question is, which of these nine things resonate with you in terms of them being absent from your life? Where do you see a lack of love? Where do you see a lack of joy and peace? But you could also flip the list, right? So instead of approaching it as the fruit of the Spirit, you could approach it as the fruit of death or the fruit of flesh and ask that same question, which of these nine things resonate with you in terms of where you see these in your life? Apathy, despair, anxiety, anger, bitterness, dishonor, deceit, hostility, and indulgence. See, being freed from the law, being freed from sin starts with recognition. 
It starts with awareness that these things are present in my life. Yes, at times I lose my patience and I'm angry with my kids. I have to own up that that is sometimes what I do. But in those moments of awareness and recognition, the response should not be simply try harder, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, give more hard work and hustle to improving your life. Rather, in those moments, when you see one of these nine things in your life, the response should be a simple prayer. Lord, set me free. Lord, forgive me and set me free. Because I am unable to heal myself. I don't have the power. I don't have the resources within myself to heal myself, but I can go to the one who does. All the resources we have available empower us to live love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and the rest. But it all comes from Christ and his spirit. And we are bound to him because of his grace. We are set free from the law of sin and death. And so therefore, we go to Christ and simply say, Lord, heal me. Forgive me. Lord, set me free. Because that's what he's come to do. He's come to set us free from the law and sin and death. So, so what if you took the time to just ask yourself that question, where do I see these nine things in my life? And again, what if instead of trying hard, you just prayed that simple prayer, Lord, set me free. You know what I think would happen in your life? I think you would have more fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, coming from your life than you knew what to do with. You'd be passing out fruit baskets like crazy right? Like imagine if every time we walked out of here, we were just filled up with the fruit of the Spirit. We'd be dropping fruit baskets on people's doors all the way home, and people would be like, another fruit basket from Meadowbrook. I can't eat this much fruit. Like fruit would just be coming from us because we recognize, ah, this lives in me. I have to own that, name that, but then I go to Jesus and just say, set me free. We would be people who are characterized by love to the point that the world would say somehow they're different. It would start to distinguish us in a way that people would be like, I want what they have. So may you see that fruit is available to you. May you resist the temptation to measure yourself and others against the law. May you see that the fruit of the Spirit is at your disposal and you have all the resources you need to live that kind of life. And may you find that it exists in the person of Jesus Christ And may you run to him so that he can set you free. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the reality of who Jesus is. We thank you so much for the care that he extends to us. That through his resurrection from the dead, he has ushered in a whole new reality. He has ushered in a whole new creation. And we are people who live in that reality now and have access to the things that he offers, this reality, this new world that he has started. Lord, I pray that we would be people who could be courageous, courageous enough to name where we fall short. That we would be wise enough to know that hard work and hustle doesn't sanctify us, but that we would have the ability to simply put ourselves in front of you and say, Lord, forgive me, heal me, set me free. We pray this in your name. Amen. Would you please stand and join us in worship?